Miril was a six-year-old Pakistani girl who had put her faith in Jesus Christ. When it comes to Jesus, Miril is fearless in her unshakable faith in her Heavenly Father's protection. And at even such a young age, she claimed she would give her life up for Jesus if she had to. After all, she says, he did the same for me. Recently, Miril came home from school with a couple of bruises and cuts. She tried to hide them, but had to tell her parents about a scuffle at school. Miril had been thrown to the ground and kicked over and over again, while her classmates hurled nasty comments at her for being a Christian. Thankfully, Miril's brother intervened and was able to get Miril away from the mob of students. But even after a month, Miril is still limping. An injury to her leg from the scuffle still hasn't healed. She says, it's okay. A boy hit me because I am a Christian. He does not like Christians. But Papa reminded me that Jesus was also hit and wounded and even killed. So it's okay. Mom says to look at it as a reminder of Good Friday at Christmas time. Little child, six years old. And of course, Pakistan is becoming a, well, a more and more difficult place for believers to be. I used to uh, know someone I went to grace with who uh, was a missionary there. And of course, became too hostile for even them to be in the country. And we need to pray for people, families, little children like Mirel, who are suffering increasingly for their faith in countries like Pakistan. Last Sunday, going through the book of Acts, we learned about the conversion of a man named Saul, the persecutor of the church, and what a dramatic conversion that was. Today, it's very interesting for us to learn, okay, so what about this Saul? What does he do right after his conversion? So take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at 19b through 31. I think if you take your uh, Bible from the chair in front of you, it's page 917. <clears throat> Acts 9, 19, B through 31. We looked at A uh, last week. Let me start reading. Sentence, really, begins at 18. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for the purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? Let's stop right there. We want to look at uh, this passage today and see... Immediate obedience. The one thing that stands out to me, really impresses me reading this passage, is the immediate obedience on the part of Saul. God honors the person who immediately obeys him in spite of all the risks that might be involved. So we want to see, God desires immediate obedience from us. This is a good model. This is a good pattern for us to learn from. We see that Saul begins to share the gospel immediately after his conversion. It says, for some days he was there with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. Well, how ironic. Rather than arresting Christians, Saul spent time enjoying Christian companionship and fellowship with these fellow believers in Christ in Damascus. They had expected him to come, and of course he came with the intention of, uh, of arresting them and, and uh, dragging them to Jerusalem, putting them on trial there. And now here he is, a brother in Christ, fellowshipping with them. And Saul did not hide his conversion. Now, you and I might be tempted sometimes to hide that kind of a big change or decision in our life, but Saul doesn't hide it at all. His pride, and he had great pride. Uh, you can see how he breathed threats against the church. We looked at last Sunday how he was just, that became his life, so passionate. 
He was proud that he had the right way and he was protecting God's law and the Jewish religion and he was going to put this down by himself single-handedly if he had to. He had a lot of pride, but he was humbled on the road to Damascus, blinded, dependent on others to bring him into the city, dependent on Ananias, one of the very men that he came to arrest, to come and, and uh, pray for him and heal him and lay hands on him and that the Holy Spirit would come into Saul, and Saul is humbled. Now, that kind of a proud man would be tempted, I'm sure. I mean, if I put myself in his place, we'd be very tempted to just kind of go incognito. I mean, let me just disappear. Let me just go quiet. Um, let me just, uh, whatever it is, change slowly or whatever. His pride would have tempted him to go into hiding. After all, abandoning his mission would have been both humiliating and dangerous. He had men with him who had come on this road together. He had instructions, a written permission from the high priest back in Jerusalem. It'd be dangerous for him to really change his entire intent now. Or perhaps if we would have been him, we might have convinced ourselves that we need time. Time to rest, after all he'd been through. This experience, blindness, this tremendous change in his life, all of that. Rest, just give me some time. to Give me some time to think. What has happened here? What a tremendous change. I came against Jesus Christ and met him on the road to Damascus. And, and, and now, now he's told me that I need to serve him, be his, his, his servant. And I've made this dynamic change and I realize he's alive and I put my faith in him. I need time to think. I need time to rethink. <laughs> I need time to learn. Uh, we would think, I, I, need, I need to become a perfect disciple. I've been so terrible, a great persecutor and whatever. Who would, who would even listen to me until I uh, change my life for a while? We'd be tempted to think all of those things, wouldn't we? Or we might just be tempted to sneak out of town and just disappear. If we need to proclaim a personal change, why not at least start in a faraway place? You know, it's easier, isn't it, for us to go to some stranger someplace. I've taken lots of people on short-term mission trips and uh, have them give their testimonies, give the gospel. And, and uh, they come back and say, okay, that was great. Uh, now can you do that here with your friends and family? Well, that's difficult. That's more, that's more difficult. It's easier to do it to strangers. Uh, Saul could have thought that same way, at least found some strangers going to a different city, something. Or maybe he would have set out to make a gradual change, so gradual that no one would really see the stark change that he had made. Okay, men, we're pretty competitive. And have you ever <clears throat> felt tempted? Maybe you were driving someplace and you had cars following you. And uh, you realized, you know what? I'm mixed up here. I'm going the wrong direction. I need to turn around. I need to make a U-turn. And all these people need to make a U-turn with me. I can say, what are we doing? Why'd we come this way? You know what? Why are we following this guy? And so we're tempted to make not a just 180 degree U-turn, but a kind of a long three block U-turn, right? <laughs> Go a long way around. May do it gradually. Well, Paul, I'm sure, experienced those temptations. But notice his reaction. Just as Saul had been, sorry if I use Paul, that's the name we know him by later, right? Luke's still using Saul, the name. Saul had formerly been passionate about persecuting Christians. And now he turned his passion to proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's equally as passionate about that. And notice that it says, as we read in verse um, 20, immediately he whispered the name of Jesus. Is that what the Bible says? He proclaimed it. He proclaimed it. That word is to make known publicly and loudly as if you were a herald giving the news from the king that everybody needs to hear. Saul immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. And notice that the issue is Jesus. Not Mm, you know, Jewish, we didn't have it quite right. We didn't interpret it quite right. Uh, you know, whatever. It's about Jesus. He is the crucial issue about which you must make your choice. He proclaimed Jesus. And where did he start? 
You know, he could have started in the streets. He could have started um, even with the Christians. He could have given his testimony there first. He goes to the synagogues. The very Jewish places that he was coming for support and to try to catch, ferret out those who might have put their faith in Jesus Christ. He goes back to those Jewish, to, to Jewish people now. And instead of saying, Jesus is wrong and these Christians are wrong and I want you to help me, point them out. I need to arrest them and take them to Jerusalem. He's now proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Messiah. As the only one in whose faith. You can have eternal life. That is what he's proclaiming. And he starts right there in a synagogue. And notice he says, he, Jesus, is the son of God. Not you should change your mind about him. He was a great teacher. We need to follow some of what he taught. You need to lessen your antagonism toward him. No, Jesus is the son of God. He knows that because he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he realizes that what Stephen had said was correct. Jesus is at the right hand of God. He was, he, he is the Messiah. He is the son of God. And notice that is, is a present tense. Jesus is alive. He is not dead. He is in the right hand, uh, at the right hand of God in heaven. He is the son of God. Now, <clears throat> again... You and I, in settings like this, would be tempted to uh, go to somebody else first. Not friends, not our best friends, not our closest family members, not our work associates we work with every day, not the classmates we go to school with every day. I mean, let's start somewhere else. That's not what Saul did. He went to those people, Jews, just like him, he himself had been. And that's where he started. And he proclaims Jesus Christ as the only way. Not some watered-down message about being good, being better, being more tolerant to Christians, changing your mind. It's about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. That is the crucial message. That is the good news. And through Him only, faith in Him, is eternal life. And the present tense, again, Jesus Christ is alive. And he is the son of God, the Messiah, as Jesus himself had claimed. And by the way, as the Jewish leaders had denied. Right? When they denied him and crucified him, they said he is not the son of God. It's blasphemy. And Paul now says, no, that's right. He is the son of God. Disregard what they said. And Saul, by the way he did this, he did not leave open a possibility for the Jewish leaders, either in, in Damascus in the synagogue system or back in Jerusalem, to say, what happened to Paul? I, I mean, he's a little bit off. Um, he, he's gone astray from his mission. Uh, you know, we need to get him back and do a little remedial training and get him back on the right path, right? He didn't leave that opportunity as a possibility. I mean, this guy has done a 180 degree turn. He is now out there proclaiming and preaching that Jesus is the son of God, the Messiah. And what is their response? Verse 21, all who heard him were amazed. And said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? Amazed. The word there means to become astounded. To such a degree as to nearly lose one's mental composure. They were beside themselves. They were, they were struck out of their senses. What in the world happened to this man? He was coming here to help us. Um, you know, get rid of Christians and arrest them. And here he's proclaiming Jesus Christ. They were beside themselves. Are you and I different enough because we're Christians that we stand out in our culture, in our school, in our place of work, in our neighborhood, in our families, that we stand out that much like Saul did, that our culture is amazed? We should be. And, well, all this controversy, what would that do to you, to me? How would we respond? I mean, they're amazed at all this. They're beside themselves. So it'd be tempting again for us to say, if we were Saul, oh, maybe we need to change our tactic, our strategy here a little bit. Maybe we need to tone this down a little bit. You know, this, this, this amount of controversy could stir up trouble. Look at verse 22. What's Saul's response? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Oh, what an interesting description here by Luke. 
He confound, the word confounded is to astonish to such a degree that mental faculties are confounded and a person is practically incapacitated. He is so passionate, he is so direct, he is so clear, he, is, he, he knows the evidence, he is reasoning so well that they are confounded. They are totally beside themselves. Um, proving, look at the word proving, to establish the truth by argument, by induction, by reasoning. How good an apologist for Jesus Christ are we? For the truth of Jesus Christ. Are we willing to study and prepare and be able to give an answer? As uh, the Bible says, the New Testament says, be prepared to give an answer about your faith in Jesus Christ. Like Saul is doing here. And you know, I point out that this is exactly what Saul hated about Stephen, right? The same words were used. He was proving with such evidence that he confounded the Hellenists in the synagogue in Jerusalem. And of course, Saul was involved in stirring them up to martyr him, to kill him. Now, Paul is doing the same place, same thing. He's taken Stephen's place now in Damascus. Saul becomes such an effective witness that he must finally escape a Jewish plot to kill him. Look at verses 23 through 25. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Well, you say, you know, if, if Paul, Saul was that intense and they were that confounded, why did it take many days? Well, Luke, of course, is giving us a summary here of this chronology. Paul, in later on the passages, reminds us that between verse 22 and 23, he left Damascus and went into Arabia and spent time there. What was he doing there? He doesn't totally say. Uh, he was evangelizing. We know that he was giving the gospel because we know later in the record that there are churches he goes back to visit in Arabia. But he's also spending time out there, probably rethinking all his understanding about the Old Testament, most, he had memorized much of it, but he had he'd not interpreted it correctly. And so now he has to reinterpret it. So he goes away for a time, about three years, and comes back to Damascus. And I think that's what Luke covers here when he says many days had passed. But now he comes back and he begins to reason again, and, and the Jews plotted to kill him. But Saul becomes aware of it. Probably somebody tells him, right? Saul is told of the Jewish plot to kill him. And by the way, it's not only the Jews, all right? We can uh, look at 2 Corinthians 11.32. At Damascus, that's where we're talking about, the governor under King Eratos was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. So Paul, writing in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians, also adds that the Jewish people had gotten the local government involved as well. And so now the, the king there, the, the governor under the king, has his soldiers watching the gates as well. So this is also now a military um, situation. And so this plot, they are trying to keep him from ever escaping this city alive. Notice that verse 25, but his disciples. Let's stop right there. Saul already has disciples. He's already led other people to faith in Christ, and he's discipling them. And his disciples are loyal enough to try to strategize to help him escape. And so it says that they took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And if we go on in 2 Corinthians to the next verse, verse 33, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Through a window. And if you understand a walled city and around the wall on the inside were, were houses. And so they wanted some windows. So as long as they were high enough up, you could have a, a window in that wall. You could protect it defensively. So they took him and let him down at night, cover of darkness, out a window and down, 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 down outside the end of the, uh, down the outside of the wall so that he could escape. 
And so he escapes that way. Well, ironically, think about this. Those whom Saul had come to kill, the believers, actually saved his life and helped him escape. Ironically, though Paul traveled to Damascus with orders to arrest Christians, he entered the city as a blind man and left the city in a basket like a common criminal. Well, in our pride, we, like Saul, before his conversion, insist on doing things our way. That doesn't threaten God. God must um, many, many times humble us as he did Saul. And change us. And some of that is ironic when we look back. Ironically, though Paul had come to Damascus to persecute Christians, he ended up becoming a persecuted Christian himself. Because of God's wonderful grace. I mean, Paul looks back at this and writes later in the New Testament, it is all by God's grace that Jesus Christ appeared to me on the road to Damascus and stopped me in my tracks and changed my life. And so Paul looks back and sees all of this as, a, as an evidence of God's grace in his life. And that's true. Now, we have to ask ourselves, reading this part of the story, how immediate is our obedience? How immediately do we obey when we realize what God wants us to do? Now, immediately we want to say, yeah, but I do wish, wish I knew what God wanted me to do. I mean, I just wish he sent me an email or a text or something, a note, a letter, a registered letter, something. If I knew what he wanted me, if I knew how to for sure decipher the voice of the Holy Spirit, then I, I could do that. Well, guess what? We have a letter. <laughs> it's very clear about much of our life and what we ought to be doing. And the attitudes we ought to have and the uh, priorities in our life and how we ought to be representing Jesus Christ. We have that clear and plain. You and I need to concentrate on what we know God wants us to do and ask ourselves, how immediately do we obey him? Or do we postpone it? Do we want to rethink it? Do we want to plot and strategize and, and um, cut corners and do it our own way and all those things? Do we read the word immediately and apply it or do we postpone it? James, in his book, in chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, addresses this. Says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Many, many people sit in church, study their Bible at home, listen on the radio, whatever the case is, and they hear a lot of things, and they're interested in having knowledge. But how much of what we do we do? I hope we don't just come to church just to learn knowledge. I hope we go on and go out every Sunday saying, God, what do you want me to do about what we learn from your word? Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You deceive yourself if you're just listening and not doing it. That's not adequate. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, if I had come here this morning, and uh, my hair was all disheveled, and I hadn't shaved, and I smelled bad, and my breath was bad, and all of that, some of you would back up a couple rows, um, clothing, you know, you'd say, what in the world happened? What happened when you got up? How did your wife let you out of the house like this? <laughs> Didn't you look in the mirror and do me? Oh, I looked in the mirror this morning, but, you know, I got busy. No, no, to look in the mirror, you need to do something. You need to be prepared. You need to change. You need to make yourself, you know, publicly acceptable. James is saying, you come and look at the word of God. And you, you see inadequacies. Between yourself and your life and your attitudes and, and, and what it tells you to do. And, and you read that from the word of God and you go away and do nothing. Got to be kidding. You're deceiving yourself. Don't be a hearer only. Immediate obedience. Like we're seeing in this passage. Saul is modeling for us. Do we obey when we realize God has commanded us to Forgive, let's say. Oh, we say, wait a minute. No, no, I, I don't feel like it. 
Immediate obedience. It's not a feeling, it's a choice. Remember the story of Sunday or two we read about Corey Ten Boom. It was last Sunday. It didn't feel like forgiving this guard who had mistreated her and ended up, you know, part of the death of her sister. But it's a choice of obedience. Forgiving. Or do we say, well, but that, yeah, but you don't understand. The offense is so great. It's just too great. I can't forgive it. There's nothing you cannot forgive. If Jesus Christ can forgive those who killed him on the cross, there is nothing too great to forgive. We are, offered, we are commanded to forgive everything. We tend to harbor bitterness and let it fester and remember that on that person. Do we act when we realize God wants us to serve others? Oh, that would be a humble, lowly task. Disciples come into the upper room that night and they are not willing to, nobody there to wash feet, so no feet get washed till Jesus does it. Are we willing to serve? And Jesus said, I do this as a model. Like I'm serving you, you must serve each other. Do we act when we realize that God wants us to serve others? Do we make ministry to others an important priority in our life? Or is it something that, oh, someday in the future, when I get everything settled, when I'm really secure, when I have extra time, I will get around to ministering to other people. Do we obey commands, God's command to worship him? God says to worship him. On a regular basis, we do that sometimes uh, personally in what we do, studying his word, praying, um, uh, personal obedience, and so on. We do that corporately as a church. The Bible tells us do not um, negate, neglect getting together and worshiping God. You say, well, I can't worship. I can't worship in this setting. I can't worship because these people are here. I can't worship with this style of music. I can't worship. I can't worship. And our mind is somewhere else. It's a command. We are to worship no matter what the setting. We're going to see, you know, later, Paul and Silas, they can worship in prison after being beaten. It's an obedience to a command. Are we effective enough to be a threat worth resisting like Saul was? You know, this local church, <laughs> the universal church, church in America, this is not our church. We don't get to run it the way we want to run it. It is God's church. It is the church of Jesus Christ. We follow his marching orders. He is the cornerstone. He is the one that bought and paid for it with his blood. We obey him. We serve him. So well, I don't like the way people, do. I don't like the way we do this. I don't, I'm not going to be involved. Immediate obedience. I'm here to serve Jesus Christ, to represent him, to make a difference for him. And if that's offensive to a world, fine. This is God's church. We need to fulfill his desires, not mine. Well, the passage goes on. And we see next that we must be willing to take some risks for God. We see that Saul returns to Jerusalem as a Christian. But he is met with great suspicion on the part of the church. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be... You know, humanly speaking, that would be understandable, right? Paul faces Christians who accuse him of not really being a true believer. Look at verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. Let's stop right there. Well, okay, they had vivid memories. The last time in Jerusalem they saw Saul, a couple of years ago, but hey... He was the most passionate person for persecuting the church. He had my brother and sister in Christ killed, put in prison, whatever the case ended up being. He went to the chief priests and got permission to go everywhere into foreign cities and arrest believers. That's my memory of him as a very passionate persecutor. Perhaps now he's just changed his strategy. What if he's now just pretending and he's really a spy? His best way he found out to find Christians is to be a part of them, to join them. And, and he's a covert spy and really we'll all get in trouble once we, he learns to know who we are. There are brothers and sisters around the world who have dealt with that, obviously, in the former Soviet Union. I've been over there and talked to believers who lived in that time and they had to be careful in the hidden underground churches, meeting and hiding. When someone came and said, you know, 
I am interested in learning about God. I'm interested in learning about Jesus Christ. Can you tell me the good news of Jesus Christ? They had to be very careful. Is this a KGB spy? Is this an agent coming to see everybody who's in this church and later arrest them all? And they had to develop ways, if at all possible, to figure that out. You and I, you and I we, don't, we don't comprehend what it would be to live like that. You know, Billy Graham went into Moscow Baptist Church and preached there. And Moscow Baptist Church was allowed, as much was Minsk Baptist Church, which I preached in. These churches were allowed to be built in preparation for the Olympics so that America could see that, well, the Soviet Union isn't as rough on Christianity as we thought they were. So they wanted to put on a good display. But the senior pastor of Moscow Bible Church or Moscow Baptist Church, Central Baptist Church, they called it, was a double agent. He was also a part of the KGB. And so people disappeared after attending this church for a while. And there were certain things the church learned they'd never dare let their pastor know. For instance, it was totally illegal to have any kind of children's uh, teaching children or have them in church or have Sunday school or anything like that. Totally illegal. And so all children's activities were done outside the church and home secretly, and the senior pastor dared never know about it. You and I can't fathom how you can function, but brothers and sisters in Christ function like that. Could Saul be one of these? So, unfortunately, there are many Christians today who doubt the true faith of people who put their faith in Jesus Christ because of some standard they don't meet or some background or something. We must be very careful not uh, to allow only the qualifications of the Bible to determine whether a person is a believer. If they put their faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says they have eternal life. And so we must follow that. To their credit, these Jerusalem Christians changed their beliefs about Saul. But how did they do that? Notice verse 27. But Barnabas. Remember Barnabas? That's not his real name. <laughs> okay? He, the Christians called him Barnabas because Barnabas meant the son of encouragement. It was Barnabas who sold the first plot of land in the early church and gave the money so that, uh, you know, the widows and so on could be served. But Barnabas took him, Saul, and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas steps in. In Damascus, Paul needed a bridge. He needed a helper. God sent Ananias to heal his blindness, to pray that he would receive the Holy Spirit, and to introduce him to the church. Now Paul has left Damascus and comes to Jerusalem. And the church will not, will not uh, even want to meet him. They will not welcome him. They will not fellowship with him. And Paul needs another bridge, another advocate. And Barnabas steps up. It's Barnabas who provides this friendship that Paul needs in this doorway into the church. Barnabas had the insight and the courage to stand by Saul at this crucial moment in his life when evidence seemed to be stacked against him. Barnabas and later Peter and James opened all the doors to Saul to the relationships of the church in Jerusalem. It's Barnabas who's willing to listen to Paul's testimony, to believe in him that he's a real believer. God has changed his life. To believe that Paul's description of his, uh, you know, uh, of his conversion on the road to Damascus is accurate. That Paul actually saw the risen Jesus Christ. To believe that. To go to the church leaders and say, listen, you've got to listen to this guy. God has done a great change in his life. <coughs> I know what your memories are of Saul. But Saul, there's word. I've checked it out. I mean, what he has said in Damascus and how he preaches Jesus Christ. You need to open your hearts to Saul. And they do, to their credit. But it took a Barnabas. We need more people like Barnabas who are willing to listen 
and then become an advocate for some newer believer who needs to be discipled, who needs help, who needs support. We need more Barnabases, sons of encouragement, people who are looking for opportunities to serve people. And so what does Saul do in Jerusalem? Saul proclaims Christ in Jerusalem to those who had martyred Stephen. <laughs> Verse 28, so he, Saul, went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. <laughs> Again, Saul, this is Jerusalem. This is where you were well known, and, and uh, this is where the leaders are, and this is where they'll enforce uh, their will on you, and so on. Wouldn't you want to be careful here? Saul is a bold witness. He is here where his greatest antagonists are, and he's boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ. We are to be a witness to Jesus Christ wherever we are, beginning among the people we know best. Saul argued for Jesus Christ with the Hellenists. You got to remember, it was the Hellenists who martyred. These are Greek speaking Jews. Greek speaking Jews who are living in Jerusalem have their own synagogue. It is them that Stephen, who also was a Hellenist, is arguing for Jesus Christ. And it's them who martyred him. Paul probably was the leader among them against Stephen. And now he goes right back to that same hotbed where he had been a leader in martyring Stephen. And he takes Stephen's place. And he is proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Wow, if you were Paul's attorney, if you were Paul's advisor, you'd say, hmm, better be careful. This is, this is hot territory, right? So, disputed is the same word used of Stephen's giving undisputable evidence of Jesus Christ to the Hellenists. Same words now used of Saul. Saul had taken Stephen's place. And they want to martyr him too. In discipleship, a new believer, we need to help this new believer go right back to his existing friends, non-Christians, and share the gospel right away. He still has an audience with them. They still know him. We need to encourage them and help them and support them in sharing Jesus Christ with them. And tragically, I'm afraid the longer some of us have been believers, the less non-Christian friends we have. And that's a tragedy, for we need to reach them. Well, verse 30 Christian brothers helped Saul escape again. So verse 30, when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So they help him escape Jerusalem. Now, Paul didn't run in the sense of for fear. He tells us in another passage, actually in Acts 22, 17 through 21, what happened. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, him, Jesus, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. They know that I killed Stephen. I'm back here giving Jesus Christ evidence of him to them. I'm willing to die like Stephen. But Jesus said, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. It was not God's timing for Paul to be martyred. He would receive the crown of martyrdom later. That would come at the end of his life in Rome as, uh, as he was martyred there. And then the closing verse, 31. Notice it says, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Periodically, we have seen Luke give a progress report, right? And this is the third one. And Luke reports that the church was unified, growing, being edified as the believers were living according to God's commands. Notice that he includes Galilee for the first time. There are now churches in Galilee. It's spreading. There was peace because, number one, Saul was no longer persecuting the church. And he's no longer in Jerusalem, creating this great stir. So they had peace, and there's a healthy awe. That's what fear of the Lord means. A healthy awe characterized by love and obedience toward God. What risks 
are we willing to take for Jesus? Are we willing to be the witness that we need to be to even our friends, our family members who desperately need to hear about Jesus? Are we willing to be dismissed, maybe? Maybe laughed at? Maybe belittled for Jesus? Right now in America, most of us are not facing martyrdom for standing up for Jesus. What are we willing to suffer? We get so used to passing up opportunities to share the gospel with others that we don't even think about it, unfortunately. Are we willing to study so that we can reason and persuade others to consider the truth of Jesus Christ? For whom could we be a Barnabas right now? An encourager, an advocate. We need to expect differences in people. The church didn't like Saul and his background and what he had done. We need to learn to expect differences even in believers, new believers. And the goal should not be to just look and relate only to people just like me and to turn away all those that are different. No, we need to encourage, be a Barnabas to those who need us and to help them grow in spiritual maturity. And, and, and just think of Barnabas again. The, what, what a privilege to have this part in the life of Saul who would become the Apostle Paul and God would use in such a great way. So we come to the end of today. Immediate obedience just stands out, just jumps off the page out of this biblical account. God honors the person who immediately obeys in spite of the risks involved. What great risks Saul was willing to face in being immediately obedient. In what area of our lives are we postponing obedience to God? And in what ministry are each of us willing to be involved for Jesus Christ? Why are we coming to church to be equipped to minister to others? I read an interesting article, and I close with this, uh, quoting a few paragraphs from this. Uh, Chris Vallotton, I don't know anything about him. I read this article, though it was very, very interesting, challenging. It's entitled, If You Go to Church to Be Ministered to, You're Missing the Point. You don't come to church to be ministered to, he says. You come so that you can be equipped to minister, so that you can be better, become better at being a minister. When you know you're a minister, you're not waiting for someone to minister to you. Instead, you go to the church to be equipped so that you can minister so to the people around you. If you work in a nail salon, you're a minister at that nail salon. Hallelujah. You're bringing the kingdom wherever you go. Some people say, well, I work in a dark city. And what I'd say to you is, it's not dark when you're there. Because you got there, maybe it was dark, but it can't be now because you're there. And you're the light of the world. So wherever you show up, light shows up. And beyond that, darkness flees when light shows up. So as we approach the weekend, coming to church, I want you to take some time and think about your perspective on church, he says. Do you usually go as a consumer, waiting to be ministered to? Or do you go with open eyes and an open heart to the Holy Spirit's moving? Picture you're going to your Sunday service as a minister of the gospel. How will you be equipped? How will you serve? How will you pour out? Father, thank you for Luke sharing this biblical account of Saul immediately after his conversion and his immediate obedience. It is astounding. And his message and his preaching and proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was amazing and confounding to those that were enemies of Christianity with him. So effective was he that they plotted to kill him. The immediate obedience, in spite of the risks, Father, we need to learn to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We need to follow this model. God, you are thrilled to use people who will obey immediately, without hindrance, without postponement, regardless of the risks. And I pray that we'd be willing to obey you and that we would be ministers, not just going around asking others to minister to us, but to seek out whom we may minister to. And Father, we pray that you would use us in a mighty way. Help us to be so different, to make such a difference that we are a threat to the enemies of Jesus Christ. We pray that we'd be willing and we'd be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen.